해운 산업에서 에너지 효율성을 개선하기 위해서 노력하는 것은 해운 산업에서 매우 중요한 문제라고 할수 있습니다. 글로벌 공급망에서 대형 원재재 업체들은 스콥3 배출을 줄이고자 노력하고 있는데요. 광업과 같은 또는 원자재 판매 계약 조건들을 보면 용성 계약이 추구하는 방향과 일치하는 경우가 드뭅니다. 공급망 전망의 에너지와 프로세스 자율화를 달성하기 위한 그러한 목표를 달성하기 위해서 운송의 에너지 효율을 위해 운영 방식에 바꾸, 바꾸어야 하는 그러한 도전 과제가 있습니다. 이상적인 스크래치스. 이상적인 글로벌 공급망은 지속적이고 심리스한 목적지, 목적지로의 원활한 운송이 중요합니다. 이러한 상황을 보다 해운 업계가 사용하는 표준 용선 계약서 양식과 관계가 있다고 할수 있는데요. 수익 모델을 위해 세워진 계약의 운송이 굉장히 중요합니다. 기존 모델이 에너지 효율화를 보장해야 한다는 것이죠. 대표적인 예로 오랫동안 확립된 그런 용선 계약서를 볼 필요가 있습니다. 법적으로 선박은 안전한 선주가 제공하는 상업적인 확실성을 보장해야 하고 정시 독작처럼 비교적 에너지 효율적인 운항이 필요합니다. 저스틴 타임 어라이벌 같은 개념이라고 할 수가 있습니다. 배출량을 감소시키고 효율성을 향상하는 데 있어서 최적의 옵션이 필요하다고 할수 있는데요. 화주들은 공급 안정성을 유지하고 공급망 파이프라인을 유지하는 과정에서 최적의 관행을 수행해야 합니다. 운송은 해운 수익 모델은 화물 운송 서비스를 이용하는 고객의 수요에 따라서 변화해 왔습니다. 그리고 그러한 서비스도 이 과정에서 잘 대응을 해와야 합니다. 통역은 자막을 참고해 주시기 바랍니다. Multiple stakeholders to develop and deliver a holistic systemic change where shipping becomes a seamless component of the global supply chain pipeline. With a clear and recognized need to work more collaboratively and blend technological solutions with contractual provisions, We stand at the threshold of a new dimension in shipping that could benefit from an alternative business model. The fourth way project is a concept for a new business model with a holistic and incentivized approach that is focused on the supply chain pipeline. The key elements of the model will be decarbonization, digitalization, sustainability, collaboration and cooperation, all of which will be drawn together to form the basis of a fourth commercial contractual solution complementing existing voyage, time and bare boat charter parties. So what are then the elements that will make a potential new business model for the shipping industry where we move away from pure commercial imperative to taking account of drivers for efficiency in the industry. So let's start by having a look at the situation with charter parties at the moment, voice charter parties used in the dry bulk sector. Um, on the screen here, you can see an example of BIMCO voyage charter parties that have been developed over the past few decades, specifically aimed at uh, individual commodities, whether it's uh, cement or coal or iron ore or brain. Uh, and these are the sort of the numbers of documents that we've produced over the past 10 years. Uh, now, the numbers in the columns here, if you look at the pink one, says 83. That's not 83,000 or 83 million or whatever. It's just 83, 83 copies of a voyage charter party. So evidently not a great demand for special commodity-based voyage charter parties in the industry. So what is being used? 
Uh, well, let's have a look at BIMCO's Gen Con 1994, general purpose Voyage Charter Party. You can see it by far and away outstrips the use of any of these cargo specific Voyage Charter Parties. So this is the big success. Obviously, this is what everyone is using. They're just taking the sort of plain vanilla Voyage Charter Party and adapting it for different commodities. But if we drill down a little bit deeper and have a look at uh, the figures for Gen Con 1994 over the past 10 years, you can actually see that it's declining in use itself. Year on year, we're seeing less and less final executed copies of Gen Con 1994. So this is not to say that there are less voice charter parties being done in the industry. It's the way these contracts are being used uh, by the industry that is perhaps changing. And it's a similar story, uh, perhaps, if we look at the time charter sector as well. So dry bulk time chartering. Again, BIMCO forms here. We can see the bulk time uh, just over 3,500, 3,800 copies in the past 10 years. Not a huge number at all. So again, these uh, specific forms may be not as popular as we imagine. And then we look at the industry's most popular dry cargo time charter party, the NYPE form, dwarfs all of the others. So it really is maintaining the top spot. But when we look at the NYPE, again, drilling down a little bit to look at a bit more details, what do we see? What is this reflecting in our industry? Well, nearly half of all of the NYP forms used by the industry in the dry bulk sector today are the 1946 version. That's a form that was written 77 years ago. Even the more progressive companies have moved on to the NYP 1993. Again, that's a 30-year-old form. But these two forms between them absolutely dominate the uh, time charter market. And the newest form, the 2015, only 6%. It's, it's a tiny percentage. So we're not really seeing people move on to the more modern forms. They're relying on older forms, which they are adapting. Uh, they're putting on additional clauses and rider clauses to make them work for current sort of business environment. So what does that mean for our industry? Well, essentially out there, we've got this old ship, the MB Time Charter Party, that contains contractual principles that were written often decades, perhaps even a hundred years ago, that are still being used in our industry because they're embedded into these contracts. And therefore, to reflect changes in the way the industry is working, changes in the way that we need to move ahead to focus more on efficiency, means we need to rewrite or overwrite some of these existing principles, which can create uncertainty and conflicts within charter parties. So we're entering a difficult area, but it's something that BIMCO has been trying to tackle um, for a long time. Things like sanctions, we all have to deal with sanctions in business. It's a very, very important part that we have some proper contractual provisions in our charter parties. In these older forms, there's nothing. There's no mention of sanctions at all. So over time, BIMCO has developed a series of sanctions clauses that you can put into your charter party. So it's like a sticking plaster approach to patch up what's absent or not uh, sufficiently worded in charter parties. Uh, we've developed a standalone clause to, to add. Same thing with piracy. Uh, we saw the growth of piracy off the Somalian coast in 2010. Um, for the first time, we saw ships with their crew being taken away and held for ransom. This was nothing that was uh, dealt with within the existing time charter parties. We needed to deal with it contractually, so we developed uh, detailed clauses to deal with that. So again, sticking plaster over something that's not quite right in these standard forms. Infectious diseases, we've just had the COVID pandemic. Um, there was nothing really written in standard forms about how to deal with this scenario where trade ships were still able to sail in and out of the ports or whatever, but there was a restriction on the movement of crew. Uh, and of course, essentially every single port in the world was impacted. So it wasn't the case of saying, I'm not going to that port. You, you, you couldn't go anywhere if that was, that was your attitude. So we, again, we needed a code of uh, operation to put in our charter parties. And so we came up with infectious diseases clauses to deal with that. And then finally, perhaps the most important thing of all that we're having to deal with in the industry is fuel and emissions. And none of these rather dated forms uh, has much in the way of dealing with bunkers. I think the NYP 1946 even refers to bunkers being best Welsh coal. It's so outdated. See people strike that out. But nevertheless, we need more detailed provisions dealing with fuel and fuel types and quality of fuels and claims against fuels in our charter parties. And fundamentally, we need now to deal with emissions. How do we deal with emissions in our contracts, uh, CII for, or whatever? All of these things have to be dealt with in a charter party. 
So again, we've come up with a whole suite of clauses that overwrite the existing principles that we find in charter parties, allowing us things to do uh, like think like slow steaming, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to do unless you write a specific clause because you have this utmost dispatch obligation, virtual arrival and just in time arrival, uh, adjusting the speed of the vessel to arrive at a port at a specific time. Again, you need to amend the underlying principles of a charter party to be able to do this. And this is what these clauses provide. And then finally, CAI, how do we deal with that commercially when the owners and the charterers have to work together uh, to operate vessel efficiently uh, and you know, reduce emissions and hopefully maintain a high CAI rating? So again, you need clauses for all of these things. And this is what we're doing to the existing older, older charter parties. It means this is getting bigger and bigger and more and more complicated and open to you know, uncertainty and perhaps uh, conflict as well. So maybe it's a time to look at a new form of uh, charter party, a new form of contract, maybe the, the charter party as we see it now, as we move into this uh, you know, more efficiency driven era, needs to be rethought slightly. We've come up with the, the fourth way here. So you know, again, we can see the, the suite of charter parties and contracts we have at the moment, the voyage charter party, the time charter party, fairboat charter parties. And now looking at, is there another way that will complement uh, these existing charters or offer an alternative uh, to their use, something that's more reflective of our drive towards efficiency. The fourth way, charter, as we would call it, is not, it's not as simple as just putting a, writing a contract. I think it has all sorts of elements to it and needs to have a much more sort of all embracing holistic approach to a business model for 21st century shipping where we're having to think about and, and deliver on different things than we have in previous decades. Uh, and it's got to be looking at the efficiency thing and it's got to be inclusive of shipping operations within the supply chain. So no longer looking at simply the relationship between the owner and the charterer. How does this shipping transportation service sit within this global supply chain pipeline? And how do we work with all the stakeholders to realize the best possible efficiencies? So how we pull this together is, uh, you know, the, the, absolutely, we need technology. We need to apply technology in a contractual context as well. I think increasingly we will see the, see the marriage of these two things together. We will be putting sensors on board ships that uh, provide us about uh, valuable information about how that ship is performing. And it's going to be information that both parties need to agree to as a single truth. And that's all be what contractually binds them to say we accept that as how the vessel is performing. And so perhaps in the future, we can look at performance clauses that reward a ship owner if he overperforms, but reduces the higher rate if he underperforms. So these sort of things, mechanisms based on, on data and information and technology that we get from ships in the future. And of course, these three, two things together, technology and, and contracts is how we're going to help drive down emissions on the decarbonisation agenda. And pulling all of that together, um, ultimately decarbonisation is one goal, but in the really, really long run, it's all about making shipping more efficient and, and make, you know, making sure it can keep efficient in the future as well. So the four key elements that we're looking at, decarbonisation, absolutely top of the agenda for the shipping industry, for all industries in general, um, working together with digitalisation, digitalisation and decarbonisation very much go hand in hand. You can't really separate the two things. We need digitalisation as an enabler to drive down emissions and to create a commercial framework for that, we need the contracts, contractualization. So bringing all these elements together, pulling them all together. But of course, for it all to work and for us to realize the, uh, the full uh, benefits of these systems, we need to work together. Collaboration uh, is a word much used in, in lots of sort of contexts and lots of conferences these days, but it essentially means all of the stakeholders need to collaborate and cooperate, work together to find solutions that will drive down emissions. And that's at the very heart of it. Um, for the shipping industry, uh, sure, we've always collaborated to a certain extent, but now I think this concept of commercial collaboration, where perhaps an owner and a charter really do need to decide and agree amongst themselves how can they can operate that ship most efficiently, um, and that's going to be a key thing in the future. So all of these four elements being pulled together to create this fourth way project. 
And ultimately, in summary, what we're looking at here is the focus needs to be on the global supply chain, the whole thing end to end supply chain, the pipeline that moves goods across this planet. Let's not forget the shipping is responsible for moving something like 80 percent of the world's goods. So we play a very important role, although we're seen as a, a marginal cost in all of this. Uh, we are seen as sort of being a reliable services out there to serve the needs of the global supply chain. But we need to be a tightly integrated part of that to make sure that we can realize the full benefits of efficiency in the supply chain. And to do that, we need to look and work with all of the stakeholders involved. We need alignment across the range of contracts that are used in the supply chain so we can realize these benefits and make sure there's a very coordinated approach uh, right from end to end. And we're going to do this by combining technology and the contracts, putting the, the, the two things together so we can you know, use the data, use the information to make well-informed business decisions and also to create new win-win incentives for parties. Um, I think Finally, the big focus here has to be on creating new incentives. Uh, in some ways, the incentives we have at the moment are in the world of efficiency is rewarding inefficiency. The sale fast then wait is rewarding an inefficiency. A demurred scheme that or it gives you compensation for a, a slow cargo operation. We need to think of other ways of incentivizing the industry uh, to become more efficient. So looking at utmost dispatch, you know, taking away the obligation to sail as fast as you safely can from um, origin to destination, that needs to be looked at. So it allows us to slow steam to use just in time arrival and other solutions. The demurrage thing as well, um, you know, that, that can be quite profitable for owners if they kept waiting for a period of time. We need to think as the shipping gets more efficient and we have less waiting time, what other financial incentives are going to be available to the owners and the charterers to make them want to work as efficiently as possible. And then finally, the speed and performance issue as well. I mean, that's something we can tackle immediately and in the short term, which is what we should do to drive down emissions now. Let's think about, um, you know, rewarding good performance. Uh, you get paid a certain rate for performing, but if you overperform, you should be rewarded for that. It shouldn't be just based on a, a sanction for underperformance, which encourages owners to perhaps describe their ship in, in terms that sort of create a buffer to prevent sort of claims and things. Let's get data that's acceptable to both parties, a single truth, and let's work towards making the shipping industry much more efficient through a new and more efficient um, contract method, a new, a new business model for the industry. Thank you very much indeed for listening.